this today we are really honored um, to have our speaker join us. For me personally, this disorder um, uh, has has been a real challenge uh, in my practice. So it's very exciting for me to introduce Dr. Michael Kelly. Academically, he is a professor of pediatrics at Northeast Ohio Medical University. And he is also now the chief medical officer of the Lymph Angiomatosis and Gorham Stout Alliance, as well as the Lymphatic Malformations Institute. And with that, I don't want to waste a minute of his time. Uh, let me say hello to Dr. Kelly. Hello. Um, hopefully I can load this. All right. So um, I, I would really like to take this opportunity uh, to thank Dr. Tosi and um, the Rare Bone Disease uh, Teleco Organizational Committee and the OI Foundation for the opportunity uh, to talk to you today about um, a, a group of rare disorders that affect bone and really trying to uh, increase the, the, the awareness of these uh, uh, difficult, often difficult to treat uh, and very rare anomalies. Um, just to, from a, um, I can't seem to, let's see, there we go. So I have no uh, financial interests uh, or conflict of interest to declare. The learning objectives today are, are listed here. It's basically to recognize and identify complex lymphatic anomalies as rare causes of bone disease in children and adults. Um, be able to uh, differentiate the, the different bone phenotypes in, in, uh, seen in diseases uh, uh, called complex lymphatic anomalies and un understand or begin to understand the, the molecular and cellular mechanisms that are involved in bone destruction by uh, these, again, very rare diseases. And when we talk about, um, you know, uh, disorders of uh, lymphatic development, we need to, to speak a little bit about the lymphatic system and, and understand normal development. And the lymphatic system is a series of uh, blind-in capillaries uh, that, that collect uh, fluid uh, and direct fluid through increasing or through uh, uh, vascular structures of increasing size uh, into a large collecting system that ultimately um, delivers uh, this fluid back into the circulatory system, um, mainly at the uh, left subclavian vein. Uh, functions include uh, fluid homeostasis. Um, it actually uh, delivers about eight liters of fluid that are uh, extravasated um, uh, with the accompanying uh, macromolecules as, and, and, and cells. Uh, from the circulatory system every day. Um, it's very important in trafficking uh, immune cells and in immune cell function. And it's also involved in the transport of nutritional lipids from the gut. And I think for this group, it's really important to understand that lymphatics are not normally present in bone. Um, and the group of uh, disorders that we're going to talk about today are actually um, uh, resultant from uh, abnormal lymphatics in the bone. And from a development standpoint, um, uh, differentiation of lymphatic endothelial cells really occurs very early in development um, and is highlighted by expression of a uh, transcription factor called uh, PROX1. Um, and um, PROX1 actually induces the expression of a, a, a VEGF uh, receptor 3, uh, which is the receptor for VEGF-C. Um, and this coordinate, this actual um, uh, interaction between VEGFR and its, and its ligand actually are very important in the proliferation um, and uh, organization and differentiation of uh, lymphatic endothelial cells and forming uh, lymphatic, uh, coordinated lymphatic endothelial or lymphatic system. And then in a fully uh, ma uh, mature uh, form, uh, you see lymphatic vessels uh, interspersed with lymph nodes. Uh, the lymphatic vessels have these specialized uh, structures called um, uh, valves, which really um, help keep um, uh, fluid flow in a unidirectional caudal direction. 
And then in the large central structures, um, the lymphatic endothelial cells are actually surrounded by smooth muscle cells. And a coordinated uh, contraction of these cells are uh, really important in the propulsion of fluid uh, toward in the caudal direction into uh, the blood circulation. Lymphatic anomalies are disorders of lymphatic development. Um, they're congenital in nature. Um, they're disorders of somatic mosaicism, so they result from activating mutations in genes uh, and growth signaling pathways, um, uh, particularly in the PIC3 uh, kinase mTOR pathway, uh, as well as the RAS uh, MAP uh, pathway. They can occur um, as uh, simple cysts, and, uh, and as demonstrated uh, in this figure here, uh, with a young man with a, 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 a cystic structure in his neck. They can be more complex in their distribution uh, and organization, and they can also be uh, associated with syndromes, um, uh, both overgrowth syndromes, uh, particularly the uh, PIC3 uh, related overgrowth syndromes of cloves and uh, clipotronane, and other syndromes, um, including Noonan syndrome. Uh, which uh, now have been known or now have been demonstrated to have uh, different types of CLAs. And, um, and again, this is just a, a schematic at the top, which really kind of gives you an idea of, of, of normal lymphatic vessels, uh, these blind end capillaries that have unidirectional flow. But in uh, lymphatic malformations, uh, what happens is that you get the proliferation of these abnormal uh, vascular structures. Uh, that produce lymph, but they don't have any um, connection with uh, the normal lymphatic system. Complex lymphatic anomalies are actually defined by the presence of high-risk features, and, and these features include sort of a diffuse um, assortment of involvement of both bone, uh, soft tissue, and viscera, and, and the viscera that are uh, often involved are spleen and liver. Uh, they're, uh, they are associated with the fusions and, and edema. Uh, there's a uh, presence of uh, coagulopathy, uh, as well as a number of other uh, 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 high-risk features. Um, they also um, have distinct but overlapping bone phenotypes. And it's really an umbrella term that consists of uh, four related but distinct diseases of lymphatic development. Um, these include Gorn-Stout disease, or GSD, generalized lymphatic anomaly, or GLA, Kaposiform lymphangiomatosis, or KLA, and central conducting lymphatic anomalies, or CCLA. And we're going to go through these um, disorders and, and really kind of introduce you um, to these disorders and the spectrum of disease that we see, but also uh, with a, a big focus on bone. Um, but realize that, that there, are, there is involvement outside of bone with all of these diseases. Gorm-Stout disease, or disappear, disappearing bone disease, has been described in the literature for decades. Um, and it's really manifest by progressive osteolysis and the loss of cortical bone. Um, although it can involve um, single bones, it's typically multifocal and regional in distribution. Um, it can have soft tissue masses, sometimes large, um, but they're almost always juxtaposed to uh, bones that are involved. Um, functional impairment uh, is related to the type of, of bone and bone involvement. Um, you can get pathologic fractures. Um, you can um, have neurologic dysfunction uh, with, uh, with uh, skull base and, and um, uh, C-spine abnormalities. Uh, and what we do see is that there is a, a, a mortality that's associated with this disease and really uh, reflects the, um, uh, the um, development uh, and, and expansion of, of pleural effusions. And this is a recurrent theme in this class of, of um, complex lymphatic anomalies is that mortality uh, is uh, very high in patients that have involvement um, uh, of structures in and around the lungs. Um, they tend to develop uh, effusions and tend to die from those effusions. 
The figures here really demonstrate um, loss of bone here. Um, the proximal humerus has disappeared. Um, you can see here um, in the, the femoral uh, uh, or the shaft of the femur is this sort of ratty uh, uh, kind of appearance with uh, cortical disruption along the course of the, the femur. And here you can see in, a, in another, um, it's even hard to see, uh, femur um, that really um, lacks any kind of conti contiguous uh, bone, normal bone. Um, again, uh, this gives you a, a demonstration of the type of bone loss that we see um, in uh, this young uh, patient in the femoral head, uh, as well as in um, the iliac crest. Um, in, in panel B, you see um, this is a T2 weighted MRI, uh, which shows um, uh, fluid uh, hyperintense um, uh, fluid hyperintensities in the in the um, uh, soft tissue surrounding involved bone. Um, and then the, the bottom two uh, uh, um, characterizations or um, uh, uh, pictures are uh, from CT, um, 3D uh, CT uh, that, that show um, uh, significant bone, uh, occipital and, and temporal bone involvement uh, in this nine-year-old boy and in this 13-year-old girl, the loss of um, ribs uh, in the thoracic distribution. Uh, this patient actually ended up dying of her disease uh, related to uh, progressive uh, pulmonary uh, effusions. And from a histologic standpoint, uh, what you can see here on this low power cross section of bone are these large cystic spaces. And what you don't really appreciate either here uh, or in higher power is sort of the vascular um, structures uh, that involve uh, the bone. Um, these are highlighted uh, when you stain for uh, lymphatic endothelial cells with antipotoplanin or D240. Uh, Live one is also another uh, lymphatic endothelial specific stain. But here you can see um, the distribution uh, and the demarcation of the, of the lymphatic endothelial structures uh, present uh, within the bone. Generalized lymphatic anomaly is really characterized by diffuse lymphatic uh, malformations that involve uh, multiple bones and usually multiple soft tissues. Uh, unlike GSD, the lytic lesions in bone um, are not, um, do not result in uh, um, destruction of the cortex. And then um, again, mortality is really associated with uh, progressive effusions. And here is just a, a compilation of different um, um, patients with different, disease, different uh, areas of disease, which show these uh, abundant uh, lytic lesions uh, in the skull, uh, in the humerus, uh, in the femur, uh, as well as in, um, sorry, as well as in the um, uh, uh, pelvic girdle. And again, uh, you can see um, as demonstrated uh, best in this figure, sort of the, the uh, preservation of the cortex um, along the surface of these lytic lesions. Um, this gives you a better de uh, demonstration of the uh, types of um, soft tissue that can be involved. Uh, in this uh, patient, you see uh, macrocystic uh, lymphatic malformations, as well as uh, splenic uh, lesions. Uh, in this patient, you also see a large macrocyst uh, here uh, on the MRI uh, in this patient. And then you, uh, in this patient, you see on a T2-weighted image, you see these uh, fluid-filled cystic structures that occupy um, the uh, vertebral bodies of uh, different um, uh, uh, or ver uh, uh, vertebral bodies of the thoracic spine. And this is a, an important slide. It, it really shows um, sequential MRIs of the same patient at six, um, uh, six, nine, and 13 years. And what you get an appreciation for just by looking at the involvement of bone, again, uh, T2 hyper uh, uh, intensities in, in the, in the um, uh, C-spine and, and T-spine in this patient, and what you can see is that 
um, there's relative stability of disease over that period of time. And um, although there are some development of some new lesions, um, this, uh, this, there's also resolution of some lesions and not a marked progression of others. So one of the things about these diseases is that they, they actually, although they are um, progressive developmental progressive diseases, they actually progress at, at variable rates and they have periods of um, significant activity uh, followed by periods of relative quiescence. And we're still trying to understand some of the triggers that are involved uh, in, uh, in patients developing active disease. Kaposiform lymphangiomatosis or KLA is considered a, a subset of GLA. Um, it's, uh, it is a, a, a more um, aggressive phenotype. It often occurs in younger patients. Uh, it occurs uh, with large um, uh, retroperitoneal and, and mediastinal masses. Um, there are, there's evidence of consumptive coagulopathy in most of these patients with resultant hemorrhagic complications. Uh, and again, they have a high mortality rate uh, due to these effusions and hemorrhagic complications. And what sets this um, entity apart uh, from GLA is not only its um, progressive and severe uh, clinical course, but also the presence of spindle cells um, uh, on histology. This again kind of gives you a flavor of uh, the soft tissue and bony involvement in patients with KLA. Um, here you're seeing a, a T2 weighted image uh, that shows um, uh, this large ill-defined uh, mass in the retroperitoneum, uh, splenomegaly with multiple splenic uh, lesions, a large, uh, uh, large ascites, as well as uh, these hyper uh, T2 hyper in intense lesions uh, within uh, the ver uh, vertebral bodies of uh, various um, various segments. And here is a contrast enhanced uh, scan, which shows contrast enhancement of um, of structures in the retroperitoneum and the subcutaneous uh, tissues of this patient. And lastly, here are the, the spindle cells that um, uh, are, can occur in sheets or clusters. And what you don't get an appreciation here is the presence of vascular structures. It looks very similar to sheets of, of, of cells. When you stain with either a panvascular marker, CD31, uh, or a lymphatic endothelial specific marker, D240, you can start to appreciate um, the presence of these very abnormal uh, lymphatic uh, uh, vessels or structures uh, within the context of, of this uh, sheet-like appearance. Central conducting uh, lymphatic anomalies are disorders of development that really result in abnormal structure and function of the large collecting vessels, um, central collecting vessels. Um, the term that these were probably were, were referred to previously is lymphangiectasia. And these patients often present early um, and they often present uh, with um, life-threatening effusions and marked um, uh, lymphedema. This, um, and just to go back to this, that this is just basically a, a plain chest X-ray which shows a large uh, effusion uh, left-sided uh, pleural fusion in a patient with um, the CCLA. Advances in imaging um, technology have actually helped us define um, the anatomy of uh, the central uh, collecting system uh, in, in normal, uh, normal architecture as well as in patients with uh, different types of diseases. This is a contrast dynamic contrast enhanced magnetic resonance lymphangiogram or DC at, uh, MRL. And um, in this, what, what is done is that you inject contrast um, in uh, the inguinal lymph nodes and you uh, monitor sort of the caudal progression of this um, through um, the collecting system into the uh, thoracic duct and ultimately into um, the, the uh, left subclavian vein. This is a, uh, on the left side uh, is, a, is a normal um, 
DC uh, MR, MRL. Um, and then uh, on the right side is a, a grossly abnormal uh, scan uh, in a patient with um, CCL, CCL, uh, CCLA. Um, and, and what you see here is basically um, a kind of diffuse, ill-defined um, collections of, of contrast um, in the lumbar uh, area, um, sort of migration in a caudal direction, but at some point, um, um, really a loss of um, the, the um, thoracic duct uh, in a caudal uh, area, which results um, in a reflux of, of the contrast and fluid uh, into uh, the pericardial, uh, pericardial and pleural spaces, as you see um, up here. And what, what we have realized is that these patients not only have abnormalities in, in their central collecting um, uh, architecture, but they actually have um, uh, uh, abnormal uh, lymphatic channels within, uh, within their bones. And this was a, a series of patients that was presented by Dr. Chandri uh, uh, from Boston at a, a recent ISFA conference earlier this year. And what you can see here are um, bone, uh, bone involvement in three different patients. Uh, and I'm just gonna highlight the fact that um, these are uh, T2 hyper, um, uh, hyper intense lesions, uh, so fluid filled lesions uh, within the bone. And, and then the middle um, demonstration is actually what appears to be a, a very, very much like a channel like structure uh, within um, an involved bone. And in fact, this is um, the demonstrate, this is something that he's been able to demonstrate in, in a number of these patients, um, this channel-like uh, defect um, that is uh, presumed to be, uh, presumed to be a lymphatic uh, anomaly. So we're anxiously awaiting, a, you know, more study uh, on, the, on the bone phenotype um, uh, within this abnormality, uh, as well as the uh, collecting systems. Survival in CLAs, um, I think, is important to, to understand. And this is um, a retrospective um, uh, study from Japan in which 85 uh, patients were identified. They were grouped based upon their histology and, and their radiographic features as either GLA, KLA, or GSD. Um, and what they found in this group is that disease onset was uh, more common in the first uh, two decades of life in, 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 these, uh, in these disorders. And um, this is a survival uh, based upon a Kaplan-Meier curve from the time of diagnosis for the whole group. And what you can see um, is that there uh, a number of these patients do die uh, within uh, the first 10 to 20 years uh, of, uh, from diagnosis. When you separate out patients with GSD from patients with GLA and KLA, there's a significant um, difference in, in uh, overall survival uh, favoring GSD. And when you separate KLA from uh, GLA, again, there's a significant, num a significant difference in, in survival. Um, uh, and, and again, cautiously, you need to be a, a little bit cautious based upon the small numbers uh, of the KLA sampling. But most of these patients with KLA uh, end up um, dying uh, within the first two years of uh, diagnosis of, um, again, effusions and hemorrhagic complications. Finally, we're beginning to, to get a much better understanding of of the genetic underpinnings of CLAs and uh, a number of the vascular anomalies. And what we're finding is that, um, that, uh, that these mutations are grouped into uh, two signaling pathways, the, RAP mass, uh, the RAP, <laughs> RAS MAP kinase uh, signaling pathway and the PI3 kinase uh, mTOR uh, pathway. And these pathways are, are both important for proliferation cell growth, differentiation, uh, and angiogenesis and lymphangiogenesis. Um, it, this, this figure kind of gives you um, a flavor of, of the different mutations, um, the diseases where uh, specific mutations occur, and then in the, in the dark blue are 
actually uh, therapeutics that have been used um, you know, for uh, patients with uh, different types of, of diseases uh, with similar uh, genetic uh, disorders or similar genetic mutations. Most of these mutations that are being found both for vascular anomalies and for CLAs um, are um, activating somatic mutations um, involved in, in genes and in, in, uh, within these pathways. Um, so, so basically you're turning on uh, these pathways uh, to varying degrees. And almost all of them that have been identified um, in vascular anomalies and CLAs have also been found in different types of cancer. So um, really understanding why they cause um, you know, vascular anomalies in one setting and cancer another is really a, an active area of, of, of research. But I just wanted to point out that, um, that GLA uh, is associated with uh, PIK3CA muta activating mutations. Um, and um, GLA, a number of patients with GLA have also been um, shown to have uh, activating mutations in the KRAS gene. Uh, KLA uh, groups uh, predominantly in uh, NRAS, and CCLA has been found uh, to involve the Efren B4 uh, receptor as well as uh, ARAF um, uh, serine uh, kinase um, uh, within the RAS MAP uh, uh, pathway. And this is just a summary of the clinical findings for CLAs. Um, again, mod it was, this was modified from a recent publication in uh, Pediatric and Blood and Cancer. Uh, really um, try to highlight the, the bone disease burden in these different diseases. Uh, cortex evaluation, uh, which can distinguish GSD with cor or cortex destruction from other members of, of this um, uh, umbrella uh, diagnosis. Although not systematically addressed there, are a number of patients that have been described with um, high uh, markers of bone turnover, particularly CTX1 um, and uh, rankle ligand, uh, uh, that are high in GSD patients with active disease, but appear to be normal uh, in uh, other uh, patients with CLAs. Um, there are a number of uh, imaging uh, findings as well as um, uh, hematologic and laboratory findings that can help differentiate this. And uh, the gene mutations uh, th that we talked uh, just talked about are, are, are designated here. I would like to say that um, disease biomarkers uh, are becoming a, a much bigger focus uh, for this group. And what um, there's some exciting work um, that really has identified angiopotent 2 as a diagnostic uh, biomarker and a biomarker of disease activity for KLA. So um, this exciting work has really allowed uh, separation uh, or identification of patients with KLA very early. And um, I think the monitoring capabilities of this uh, biomarker will come uh, in uh, to uh, uh, benefit when, uh, when, when we start uh, looking at therapeutic trials. So some of the medical treatments, and I'm just going to go over a couple of examples of medical treatments. Um, the, the treatments really uh, focused on two areas. One uh, was uh, the interruption of, uh, interruption of the, the PIK3 kinase uh, mTOR pathway um, uh, with uh, inhibitors that have been studied in, in uh, pediatric patients. And the other are anti-angiogenic approaches. And the reason for that is that um, even prior to knowing the, the underlying genetic um, uh, mutations associated with these diseases, we knew that VEGFC, which was important in lymphangiogenesis, uh, signals through um, uh, the PI3 kinase pathway. Uh, and we also know that, that mTOR is, is a regulator of uh, normal lymphatic uh, function. Um, so uh, mTOR inhibition was one that was looked at initially. And um, this is some pioneering work that was uh, initiated by Dr. Denise Adams, uh, initially at Cincinnati, Boston, and, and, and now CHOP, 
but basically she's pioneered the use of um, serolimus uh, in patients with uh, a variety of uh, lymphatic uh, anomalies and, and in particular uh, for patients with, um, with um, uh, complex uh, lymphatic anomalies. And this, this is a, a recent uh, paper that describes uh, their experience both from a prospective uh, clinical trial as well as uh, retrospective collection of data and from patients that were treated according to protocol but not on trial. And um, this is um, 18, uh, 18 patients in total, most of which had GLA. 90% uh, of those patients had lymphatic involvement of the bones. Uh, distribution of that bony involvement, uh, eight out of 10 had uh, vertebral involvement, 50% uh, had involvement in ribs. And what they found was that um, a, a significant number of these patients did have improvement in bone symptoms and uh, functional impairment uh, with the treatment of serolimus. And what they looked at are clinical status as well as radiographic imaging. And what you see here is that a majority of the patients actually did respond in, um, in it with improved clinical status was only a small percentage or a, a smaller percentage, about 30% of the time, had any uh, radiographic evidence of, of improved disease. When we break out uh, patients um, with bone involvement, uh, what you can see here are uh, the, the diagnoses, uh, GLA versus GSD, uh, age at diagnosis, uh, the bones that are involved, and really the, the bone de uh, disease response. Um, uh, clinical assessment at baseline and clinical assessment after um, treatment with serolimus. And up here, this is a table of definitions. So it gives you an idea of um, when they talk about grade one or grade two, they're grading um, the, the uh, functional impairment um, uh, due to uh, bony involvement. Going from grade zero, which is no bone involvement, grade one, which is asymptomatic, uh, with uh, ra radiographic findings only, uh, all the way to complete loss of uh, function uh, related to uh, bony involvement. And what you can see in this is that most uh, individuals presented with symptomatic disease, um, uh, mo uh, with symptomatic disease, some with altered um, activities of daily living or ADL, and you can see that there was um, a, a marked improvement in most of these patients uh, with treatment of serolimus anywhere from a year to three years. So in addition to serolimus, um, anti-angiogenic therapies uh, were, were tested. And the largest group um, that's, that's available in the literature is, is from Spain. Um, and um, our colleagues in Spain actually treated 17 patients with evidence of active osteolysis um, or osteolysis uh, with anti-angiogenic therapy that included interferon alpha 2, 2b uh, combined with zolindronic acid. And again, uh, the rationale here was that these were patients uh, with bone disease and osteolysis uh, and that they wanted to use um, a bisphosphonate in addition to interferon. And zolindronic acid uh, is believed to be or believed to have um, probably the, the or, or believed to have um, a significant um, uh, anti-angiogenic effects in addition to its effects uh, on uh, the osteoclast. The primary measure here was uh, stabilization of disease, and again, these are patients that had active uh, bone destruction. Um, and the secondary uh, measure was uh, improvement in pain and function. And what's important here is to show that all 17 showed stabilization in, in bone destruction at the end of the treatment period, which was anywhere from uh, six to 15 months, and all actually um, showed improvement in pain and function. And what they what they did uh, comment on but did not show is that very few had any improvement uh, in um, imaging findings um, in this group. So what we can say based upon this and other uh, studies of medical therapies in the CLA group is that they're really designed uh, to help control disease symptoms. 
but are not curative. Um, and I think that, you know, a better understanding of the underlying genetics and cellular mechanisms um, that lead to um, disease may provide more effective therapies for patients with CL CLAs. And I think what this is demonstrated by the use of MEK inhibitors in patients with um, uh, NRAS mutations, uh, with KLA and NRAS mutations, and um, the CCLA group, which is a group of uh, rasopathies. And what they're finding in small numbers of patients is that um, these patients actually do respond and um, it, there uh, is uh, considerable excitement about expanding um, MEK inhibitors uh, into the treatment of other uh, patients with vascular, vascular anomalies related to uh, rasopathies. And then what I would like to do now is really talk uh, about some of the mechanism of bone loss in CLAs. And, and this has come from um, uh, work from uh, Mike Dillinger, Dillinger's lab in, at UT Southwest and his international uh, colleagues, which have developed preclinical models of this disease in, in trying to unravel um, the, the signaling and cellular mechanisms that result uh, that result in uh, bone, um, uh, bone destruction. And I'm just going to summarize uh, what he's found, and I'm going to walk you through uh, some of these uh, studies. Um, one is that overexpression of VEGFC in bone uh, stimulates the develop, development of lymphatics in bone and results in osteo progressive osteolysis. Uh, bone lymphatics develop in a stepwise manner, they develop um, initially outside of the bone, and then they migrate in. So they outside in uh, um, development. And then development of bone um, uh, lymphatics requires the, the presence of functional osteoclasts. So what this group did um, was uh, use a um, inducible Crelock system uh, to express VEGFC in a bone-restricted fashion. And um, they used a bone-specific uh, promoter from uh, the Ostrix, uh, Ostrix gene uh, really to drive um, this uh, tetracycline um, transactivator cassette. And, um, and this is uh, schematically presented here. So in these mice, um, in these mice, if, uh, VEGF is on uh, in the absence of tetracycline. Uh, in the absence of tetracycline, um, the, the transactivator uh, activates uh, the expression of VEGFC. So VEGFC is, is on in bone. And it's off in the presence of doxycycline. So doxycycline will bind to uh, this transactivator and inactivate it. So uh, uh, VEGFC is not expressed. What they found was that um, if they express um, high levels of VEGFC in uh, bone uh, during uh, embryonic development, um, this resulted in uh, embryonic um, lethals at a time of about uh, between 14 and 15 days of, of development. So they overcame this um, lethality by actually um, providing doxycycline, i.e. turning off um, the VEGFC expression during, um, during uh, the gestational period and then removing uh, doxycycline um, in, in, um, in the postnatal period and allowing uh, development of lymphatics. And what this, what this uh, schematic or what, what, what these pictures show here is um, really the, the, the evolution of lymphatics in cortical bone at various times um, post VEGFC activation. And you can see uh, at 21 days post activation uh, or VEGF expression, there's very little, if any, uh, measurable lymphatics uh, within the bone. But as you go to um, day 28 and then day 20, uh, 35, you see marked increases in lymphatics uh, within the bone as demonstrated here by LIV2 staining uh, specific for lymphatic endothelial cells. 
And the, the far right schematic really uh, quantitates um, the, the type of uh, lymphatics or that the quantitatively assesses lymphatics uh, within the, the, the uh, transgenic uh, mice that were examined. Next, they really wanted to look at the origin of bone lymphatics. Um, do uh, the lymphatics arise from cells within the bone uh, or do they uh, migrate into the bone from, from um, uh, normal lymphatic endothelial cell precursors um, that, that normally occupy soft tissues outside of the bone? And so uh, what they did here, again, using the same um, system, is um, they uh, uh, they expressed uh, or um, they expressed VEGFC specifically uh, in uh, in the bone uh, in in postnatal mice um, and looked at accumulation of these lymphatics in soft tissue surrounding the bone uh, within within the cortex of the bone and then ultimately in the bone marrow and in the in the um, uh, overexpressing or hyper, th those mice that hyperexpressed uh, VEGFC um, limited to the bone, what you see is that there's a, a dramatic increase, early in, uh, increase in lymphatic endothelial structures in the soft tissue surrounding the bone. This is followed by um, uh, cortical uh, bone involvement um, uh, in uh, uh, by lymphatic endothelial cells uh, in, in this particular uh, set of, of pictures. And then uh, finally, um, what, what they did was look at um, lymphatic endothelial uh, vascular structures uh, in bone marrow. And so the schematics on the right really quantitate um, the, lymphatic, um, the lymphatic vessel index. And you can see uh, first, there's an accumulation of lymphatic endothelial uh, structures in the soft tissue, followed by cortical uh, bone involvement, and then followed by uh, bone marrow. So, um, so what they did show was that the, these, um, these lymphatics actually um, develop from a PROX1 lymphatic endothelial cell precursor. Uh, and they, they migrate uh, from the outside of the bone into the bone in a stepwise fashion through the periosteum into the cortex uh, and into the bone marrow. Next, they wanted to, to look and see what cells are required for, um, for osteolysis or the development of bone lymphatics. And what they previously um, shown was that there's an increased number of osteoclasts in these transgenic mice that hyperexpress VEGFC in the bone. Um, once um, having that information, they really wanted to look to see if there was any approximation of the osteoclasts with these vascular structures uh, as they transver or, uh, migrated into the bone. And what you can see here at the top is that indeed um, there are osteoclast uh, appearing cells that appear to be juxtaposed juxtaposed uh, to um, the uh, vascular endothelial structures. And um, these uh, cells uh, stain with TRAP, which is um, uh, um, an activity that is, is actually uh, a, a good marker for uh, osteoclast activity. So next they wanted, to, so this suggests that uh, there's an increased number and that these are juxtaposed but what they wanted to do was use a genetic model to really assess whether uh, the presence of um, osteoclasts are absolutely required for uh, the development of bone lymphatics. And here they used um, a, a, a genetic strain uh, which um, in, impairs the expression of the uh, protein. This is the protein. Oh, colony stimulating factor one, um, which is uh, which is required uh, for uh, the development of of osteoclasts. And when they cross um, this strain of mice with their uh, hyperexpressing VEGF strain, 
Um, what you can see here is a heterozygous wild type mutant uh, with uh, um, uh, colony stimulating factor one uh, activity. So these mice actually have a colony, colony stimulating factor uh, and produce um, osteoclasts. And you can see the development of lymphatics uh, within, uh, within uh, the cortical bone uh, and, and presence within the bone marrow. But when you use a line uh, which uh, there is no expression of this uh, stimul colony stimulating factor one, uh, these, these individual mice have no osteoclasts. And what they do is fail to develop um, lymphatics uh, in uh, structures in uh, cortical bone uh, or in bone marrow. And these are qualitatively or quantitatively assessed in, in these diagrams using the lymphatic vascular or vessel index uh, as described above. And then lastly, uh, using this model, um, they looked at the effect of serolimus to suppress the development of bone lymphatics. And then here, again, using the same model of uh, expressing uh, uh, VEGFC in a bone-restricted fashion, uh, postnatally, um, they actually gave the mice uh, rapamycin uh, or a vehicle control um, it, during uh, the critical time uh, during which uh, lymphatic endothelial cells um, migrate into bone. And what you can see here um, is that um, in the vehicle control, um, there are uh, significant numbers of um, significant numbers of vascular uh, or, or lymphatic uh, vessels within uh, the bone. Um, that's markedly reduced uh, in the rapamycin-treated uh, uh, cells. And, and again, a, another indicator here is, is looking at cortical um, uh, uh, porosity uh, of, of the bone, of the involved bone. And you can see uh, both here and in the figure um, to the right, that, um, that the porosity is much increased in the vehicle uh, control versus uh, rapamycin treated. So this suggests that rapamycin or in, mTOR inhibition can actually uh, reduce uh, the development of, of um, uh, vascular or reduce the development of lymphatic uh, vessels uh, within the bone. So some take home messages uh, from this overview. One is that CLAs are progressive disorders of somatic mosaicism. They involve soft tissue and bone. Um, there are distinct uh, but overlapping bone phenotypes um, between the different diseases under this umbrella heading. Um, uh, signaling, veg VEGFC signaling, as well as uh, the presence of osteoclasts are important for developing lymphatics in bone. And, um, and really a better understanding of the molecular and cellular mechanisms uh, resulting in disease uh, will help provide uh, better and more personalized therapies for uh, our patients uh, with CLAs. And uh, again, I wanna thank you all for your attendance and your um, uh, and, and um, your attendance. And, and I would like to thank our uh, patients um, who are part of this process and really lead us uh, to uh, new discoveries. Um, and uh, Dr. Dellinger and Steele uh, for, their, um, for their critiques of, of the presentation. And um, Jack Kelly, who's no relation, uh, the president of the LGDA and Tiffany Ferry, president of LMI, uh, for their uh, support and persistence, and and you know they're uh, they're uh, a big reason why I'm here today talking to you uh, in this uh, rare D disease uh, seminar series, and I would also like to point out that Dr. Dillinger has done a really nice job of uh, developing uh, the Lymphatic Malformation Institute website, and there are a number of resources. Uh, 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 on the website that uh, those that are interested in learning more about these diseases uh, can use. So again, thank you for um, uh, your attendance and your attention. Thanks tremendously. That was a extraordinary